at Slow Brew in downtown San Luis Obispo, and I'm very excited to be with one of my uh, musical idols, Mike Peters from The Alarm. Mike, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Nice to be here. And uh, you're, of course, going to be playing here in San Luis Obispo, and uh, you uh, were here back in the 80s, actually, it sounds like. That's and right. you, do you have any good memories of being in San Luis Obispo back then? I do. Uh, the stage nearly collapsed halfway through the show. At the, oh, really? okay. We were playing uh, the local college, oh, okay. and uh, they'd set up the stage slightly wrong, and, and it was a seated audience, but everyone, I got everyone out of the seats, and they all rushed the stage, and the pressure almost collapsed the stage. So, yeah, it was uh, saved by our road crew holding it up, and so it was a really memorable night. So, yeah. And, and you know, um, some folks say that uh, San Luis Obispo was one of the happiest cities in America, but it's it's uh, um, that memory sounds kind of like a negative memory. So I hope that there's some good things associated oh, with yeah. San Luis. It, it was a great memory. It was yeah. one of the ones we, we've always had. You know, you, you hope for something unique to happen at every town yeah, that you play. And, uh, and so the stage collapsing was definitely a first right. in history of the alarm. Uh, it's never happened since, well, and uh, we remember it really. And it was a fantastic show. We okay. we went off for t 20 minutes or so, and everyone helped rebuild the stage. Okay. And we, okay. uh, and it was a it was a great night when everybody came together to make the evening okay. work. And that was uh, yeah. it was such a great positive experience. Wow. Very poetic. Thank you, Mike. Um, I will talk to the uh, some of the guys here tonight to make sure that we don't recreate that event here on stage at Slow Brew. So uh, we'll, I'll, I'll assure you, I'll take care of that. But uh, Mike, I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I mean, just you're, you're such a uh, wonderful legacy of of music over the years. But I wanted to talk about um, basically your origins as a musician. You know, in England, um, and kind of what inspired you to actually become a musician. What artists you really listened to when you were younger, etc. Well, I grew up listening to the sort of glam rock era, David Bowie and Mark Boland and T-Rex, yeah. and, and then that, that became uh, a, an actual manifestation of wanting to play music when I saw the Sex Pistols in 1976, okay, in okay. October 76, and uh, it was as up close as you want it to be. It was confrontational, yeah, yeah. but it made you go home and want to turn those chords that you knew into something real. It's funny because we've actually interviewed so many bands from, um, especially who started in the 70s, who say the very same thing. It's amazing how many bands were inspired in going to see the Sex Pistols and who came home instantly and were like, we're going to start our own band, our own punk rock or garage band. Absolutely. Well, very much so. I mean, Britain is a, is a small state. It, yeah. it, you know, you could squeeze probably four of them into California. Yeah. So <laughs> every, anything that happens there is direct. Yeah. It gets to everybody at the same time. Yeah. Uh, we, we used to, in in those days there was only one radio station, one TV channel, yeah. so everyone got all the information at the same time. So if you were open to it, it affected you instantly. Wow, wow. Yeah, I had read online that um, one of your first bands that you were in were uh, was called the Toilets. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. We started a, a punk band straight after seeing the Pistols, and uh, we exploded pretty fast. We started playing with the Clash and the Buzzcocks and okay. Susie and the Banshees, the Slits. We we played with all the iconic bands of the time, uh, and but we we were from Wales. We were from a small town, and we, we didn't really have a Sven Gali behind us who who knew about music culture like the Pistols had Malcolm McLaren yeah. and the Clash had, had um, you know, Tony, uh, Bernie Rhodes. Right. Um, and and, and we, we just had to discover it ourselves. And it was pre-internet. Yeah. So to find anything out, you had to go to it wow. and then try and absorb it as fast as you could before you brought it home wow. to distill. Wow. That's so amazing, and we've actually um, talked to the guys from Buzzcocks. Uh, talked to actually interviewed Dave Wakeling from the English Beat right here a in the same booth, and he talked about how influential just that movement was in England, in different parts of England, whether it was Manchester or elsewhere. Um, but uh, I actually wanted to talk to you uh, in looking back at those early uh, hungry years. Uh, what are some memories that stand out to you, like uh, other bands that you uh, toured with, or uh, me memories of performing with other artists back in the day? Well, being in America, the, the fondest memory, and one of the fondest memories I've played with you too. We played with them. Uh, we first played with them in December 1981. We we came to open for them in 1983 on the war tour, and it was our first experience of America. We were at Under a Blood Red Sky. We played with them at big shows in Britain. We're still great friends. You know, I just played um, a concert for the BBC in Britain just before I left uh, to celebrate 30 years of our debut album, Declaration, coming out, and you two sent a film to, to uh, uh, pay their respects to the album and they sang Blaze of Glory and you know so yeah that they're, they're, they've always been a great band for, you know for a lot of us I think we owe a debt to you two when they were one of the bands that broke alternative m music in America Definitely. 
and uh, and unlike a lot of people who close the door behind them when they have success you two kept the foot in the door kept it open for the bands like rem and every yes. you know ourselves the alarm and the english beat and yes, yes. all the bands that came after and then the 80s it, it got pushed pushed the door got pushed open and, and uh, a lot of bands were able to to come through and they happened to be british bands because i think we sit we'd we'd gone through punk rock yeah. Um, um, and we were able to pass that on to the American audience and that's when you got the Green Days coming through yeah, and yeah. Nirvana, you know, if you look at their favourite bands, a lot of them were British bands, yeah. you know, and, and, and also, but they recognise the great American bands like yeah. that were under, were so, they were deep underground, much yeah. deeper than we were, yes. you know, the Pixies, the Long Riders, the Replacements, yes. they're, they're, in a way they're only getting their, their credit paid today. Big time. And actually, speaking of the replacements and the Pixies, both of them were at Coachella. Yeah. And uh, I'm really hoping to see you up on stage, maybe at Coachella 2015, perhaps. Yeah. A, uh, Great. Know. Maybe the Coachella uh, promoters are listening and yes. watching and they'll have us on the show. We broke it here first, y'all. We have, we have, I have to call it like I see it. I, I love John Peel. I love listening to the John Peel radio archives, all the early recordings of bands. You guys did some John Peel sessions early on, right? Or... No, we never actually did a session for John Peel, but he played our early records. We, we ended up doing sessions for other people. At the Alarm, we sort of bypassed the John Peel thing quite fast because because we ended up becoming friends with you two, and then our success happened in America. Gotcha. The, the Alarm broke here when we were very unknown in Britain, gotcha. um, and we came on tour with America because... They were friends of ours and they were they were breaking America and they wanted to continue their tour yeah. to Colorado and do the big Under the Red Sky show. Yeah. But it was they said they'd continue the tour if they had a band they liked on tour and it happened to be us. So we came out and, and our, our first EP was uh, was released during those early days when we were here with you too. And our first television appearance was on American Bandstand and we did MTV. Wow. And, and we actually flew home to go on, on the British television shows when the success happened. And, and in, in the, the early days yeah. of the alarm, our first television appearance in Britain on Top of the Pop show was, here they come all the way from America, the alarm. And people thought we were American band. <laughs> But we were from Wales. They were all saying you don't sound American. <laughs> I think one of the first interviews I did was with uh, was with Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys. He was a journalist working for Smash Hits, and he interviewed me. And I think it, I remember him saying to me, "You don't sound like you're from America, though." And I said, "Well, not from Wales." <laughs> Yeah, I'd seen, seen a quote. I'm not sure how true it is, um, but uh, there was a quote from um, supposedly John Peel. He was talking about bands that have double names like Duran Duran, Talk Talk. And I guess at that point, um, uh, Alarm, Alarm, Alarm was actually a song title. And he had made a joke that he might have to change his name to John Peel, John Peel, because of this trend of uh, double, double. Uh, yeah, that's very true. We, we'd written to John Peel to say we were going to change the name to Alarm Alarm. And then he made the joke about changing his name to John Peel, John Peel. So I said to the lads, we're going to be called the Alarm from now on. <laughs> and that forever set the course of your destiny right there. Wonderful. <laughs> well, um, Mike, so many questions I have, and I know your time's limited tonight. Um, but I want to talk to you, of course, about um, I really loved the show on VH1, uh, Bands Reunited. And I, I, in terms of my dream job, if I could be the host of that show, that's what I would Richard do. Blade. Yes, yes, yes. Richard Blade. D to be able to um, br try to bring back um, bands that were so influential to me I I when I was younger. And so you all, what was that experience like, being on television and having that kind of chronicled? Because it's a very personal thing. Different band members, there's histories there, there's, there's uh, backstories. Was that, was that a positive experience, um, being on the show? It was really positive for, for the alarm. We all knew each other anyway. You know, yeah. I mean, knew each other. I mean, we've been in a band together, but we were still friends at the yeah. time. And um, and it, when it when it happened, when I got approached, I was yeah. at a gig. I was playing a gig with Billy Duffy from the Cult, with Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols, yes, okay. Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats. We were touring together okay, okay. Uh, as a under a banner called Dead Men Walking, playing each of the songs. And I thought yeah. the camera crew were coming to do something on that. And then yeah. they said, "Oh no, we're from this show called yeah. Bands Reunited. Will you play with the Alarm?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah of course." because all the members of the Alarm had joined the Alarm, the modern era yeah. Alarm on stage at one point or another. Okay. So it was an easy step and, uh, I, I, and I was glad that it was filmed and then in the same way our last gig of the, uh, as a band was filmed uh, when I left the group on stage. The, it was great that the one that happened after it was filmed so everyone could see it gotcha. uh, and, uh, and luckily for us and, and, and VH1 um, came 
and worked with us because I said, look, it's, we're not just going to play two songs like everyone else is. We're going to do a full gig. And they filmed the whole thing and, and you, you can get the DVD from the alarm site, the bands reunited and cut. So it, it was it was great and it, it was great for the band to play together. And, you know, just just it was I thought it worked on all sorts of levels. It was it was humane. It was it allowed us to deal with the past. Sometimes when you try and put a band together yeah. yourselves, it's difficult. But because there was a third party that had nothing to do, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, VH1 had, didn't have any bias towards anybody. Yeah. They just got us all in a room, let the story yeah. come out in the way it should come out, and that was it. It was good. We mentioned Richard Blade before, who was a K-Rock DJ in the 80s. He, he was the one that was making all the calls to bring the bands together okay. behind the scenes because okay. he knew everybody. And he was he was he wrote he was emailing me about we're doing a book about influential 80s yeah. bands we want yeah. to do an interview so I didn't know there was a an online a, you know on gotcha. screen presenter we got but he was great and he was really into it and I, I think again what what worked was they did it completely differently to how I would have expected them when when when, when they doorstepped me so to speak. Yeah. Um, the first thing I did was ignore the release forms they were thrusting in my face okay. and ran out the room and phoned the old band members and said, you never guess what's just happened to me. And they said, ah, oh, wow. we've already been had. Oh. So they, they usually would go to the lead singer last, right? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, which I thought would, was the wrong way to go. Yeah. But, but I can understand there was all the drama because I think they weren't afraid for the program's sake if, if the band didn't reform. Yeah. I think they wanted the story rather than yeah. just the reformation because there's a lot of drama in... You know, in the in the way Frankie goes to Hollywood, made it to the last second, okay. and then Hollywood wouldn't go on on stage. I was there when all that happened, and wow. and, and that that was it was dramatic. It was good. It was good, awesome. and uh, I think most bands would recoil in horror at the idea of the show. But yeah. I think when it actually happened and it went out, they were quite pleased. And luckily for me as well, I bumped into a guy called Kevin Hunter from a band called Wire Train, who were an eighties band from San Francisco, okay. who were a really great underground band, yeah. and went on to become Cheryl Crow's backing band. Wow. And they had a great story, and they used them as the pilot show. And I bumped into him way oh. before I got jumped by VH1. Oh, wow. okay. And as soon as it happened, I thought, "This is the show Kevin was telling me about." Oh, okay. So I was kind of given a bit of insight into it, which is accidental. You mentioned uh, Richard Blade earlier, and talking about college radio or radio in general. Of course, Richard Blade, famous K Rock DJ, and we actually met Richard Blade not that long ago. He um, in Southern California, he hosts a lot of sort of '80s revival shows, and I've actually heard him very rever reverentially talk about um, his role uh, in terms of um, continuing to keep uh, the dream alive. I think he really, he does view himself as somebody who continues to um, support bands when they're touring. He's really um, sincere and dedicated in terms of showing up and introducing the bands. And he's he just a really great guy. And I could totally picture him being so supportive of what you guys were doing. He's fantastic. Yeah. I spoke to him today, funny enough. <laughs> Maybe he'll see this interview. Richard, uh, we'll We'll, we'll be we interviewing. Love you, we love you. We'll be interviewing you, ne you next to get your side of the story. Rich is great. You know, he's been a support for the whole generation of bands that I'm, I come from, and and he's he's helped keep some of our music fresh. You know, I listen to his show on on, on Sirius Radio, yep. and he goes deep into the bands. He, he plays album tracks, and and you know, he's he knows everything about all the bands that came from that generation. And a lot of people, they 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 move with the times, you know, and they drop bands. Yeah even though they still like them and they think, well, their, their career's over. Whereas Richard has always just stayed with it and, and he's helped us through, you know, he's helped us through a lot of tough times musically and he's always stayed in tune with what we're doing today musically. Um, and, uh, and uh, but you know, and, and the history is the bedrock that play that and get people through the door. And then he comes and say, wait, did you hear these new songs from the guys? And, yeah, yeah. you know, he's, he really helps bridge the distance that happens because a lot of the time your audience grow up with you in the 80s, yeah. like ours did. And then they move on because they've got jobs, careers, families to yeah. bring up and they move away from rock and roll. And then all of a sudden the kids grow up and they want to come back yeah. into it. Yeah. And Richard is shows are often the door for their way back in. There's all those millions of people that bought alarm records in the past. They've still got them. Yeah. You know they're still there, and they occasionally they find one in the loft, or they pull one out, and they or they hear a song on the radio, and think, "Wow, I love that band." And they make contact through the Alarm.com website, and yeah. and then they come back in and they realise all all the stuff that's been going on and ongoing, yeah. and all all the, all the things that that have spun out from the music, and and, and we're still relevant, and and we still have a part to play in people's lives yeah. and getting through everyday events with the music that yeah. we do, and 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 life-changing events as well. So it's it works works on all levels.